Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. Tho Bishop here with Ryan Macon. And uh, man, we weren't sure what to talk about on today's show. And then sure enough, the regime provides, as it so often does. Uh, just last night, I'm sure everyone there knows, the FBI raids Mar-a-Lago. Now, what is interesting on this, I think it's from a, it just hits, I think, a lot of good classic Mises U topics, right? You know, we, we now see, you know, I, I know my uh, Facebook feed full of, you know, Fox News, Tucker Carlson fan boomers are talking about the weaponization of the FBI, the DOJ. This now, I think, is the go-to talking point from Republicans. But this is why I'm very thankful to be joined by Mr. McMakin, who was out there uh, calling for the abolition of the FBI before it was cool. And of course, obviously, we know the FBI has always been a political tool. It's a way of, a way of subverting uh, state power and, and providing additional power to D.C. And so, Ryan, what does this look like from your end, seeing normal people waking up to these abuses of the administrative state in a way that we've often understood. Can you talk a little bit, you know, what, what does this mean? What do you think the significance of this might be uh, in the long run? As again, we're seeing once again, the collapse of faith in institutions playing out in the mainstream in a way that, you know, I, I, it seems like they keep escalating this, this collapse of faith in the state. Well, it's always nice to see people criticizing the FBI uh, and to note that the FBI is a political organization that acts to support its political allies. Uh, for a long, long time, of course, dealing with conservatives mostly, they would fall all over themselves uh, to support federal agents, the FBI, so much of the reason the federal government has power uh, at, at the level it has is because for decades, uh, at least since Nixon, um, have have run on these law and order tickets, and that usually meant granting more federal power to federal agents through the FBI, who were supposed to be these consummate professionals who would whip local law enforcement into shape and do what uh, other law enforcement agencies either wouldn't do or couldn't do. And, uh, of course, there's the FBI that led the massacre at Waco, uh, killing women and children. It was the FBI who led the raid at Ruby Ridge, shooting unarmed uh, children and women. And uh, the only opposition you ever heard was very muted from, uh, you know, just uh, what were considered fringe groups. But mainstream conservatism, these are great heroes, wonderful people. And so the exact same sorts of people that burned down a building around women and children are the same sort of people that are at the FBI now. Uh, in many cases, the exact same individuals who, of course, been now promoted since 1993 to the upper echelons of the organization. And one of the nice things, though, about what's happened since 2016 is that it's just become more and more brazen, more and more apparent. And you saw that really just kind of dying in real time in 2016 uh, when James Comey clearly went out of his way to protect Hillary Clinton from any sort of investigation or prosecution. And you still had conservatives lining up saying, oh, well, James Comey is a good man, an honorable man, and he's just afraid. He doesn't want to investigate uh, Hillary Clinton because he needs to protect his family. Um, it's just more naive nonsense from Beltway conservative types because it became a, obviously apparent uh, within months and over the next 18 months and the next couple of years, that Comey uh, clearly was just covering up for uh, the Clintons, had no interest in prosecuting him, is an extremely wealthy, well-connected, powerful man, and was more than happy to intervene to protect his friends from any sort of prosecution. That's, that's what the FBI has been there for, for years, is to prosecute the more powerless and to protect presidents and other high-ranking people from any sort of real uh, investigation and prosecution. And that's clearly how the FBI works. The FBI is a Washington-based organization there to protect Washington and its interests. And so a lot, because of the way the FBI has treated Trump, who... 
uh, for whatever reason, since he ran for president, he was clearly an insider before he ran for president, uh, hanging out at the White House uh, with the Clintons and those sorts of people, but did something to really annoy these people I, and so has been considered an outsider ever since then. And the FBI, the CIA, other organizations have, have gone out of their way then uh, to, even while he was still running, um, to make up stories about Russia Gate, uh, to protect Biden and Hunter Biden, and denounce all evidence against Hunter as Russian propaganda, all of stuff that's been not corroborated. Uh, the FBI just seems to be there to, to any anything that we don't like. That's Russian propaganda. Uh, but we'll just investigate anyone that uh, the ruling regime doesn't like and seize their goods and. Uh, occupy their homes, all of that stuff. So this idea that the FBI is a bunch of good, honorable men uh, who can't be persuaded by politics is more obviously nonsense than ever. And I think uh, James Bovart's phrase for the FBI, which he calls a Stasi for America, is uh, probably the most accurate way to describe that organization. This is what is so fascinating about it, is that you're the way that the regime has responded to the Trump era, right? It's like, this is all about Trump. Like, like again, like, you know, Trump, this, this was a man who did not pardon, right, Assange or Snowden or any of these great enemies of the state, right? When, when that, That's something he could have done without any sort of other political approval. You know, he's someone where if you look at his legacy, you know, th there's nothing there that is all that different than what you would expect from you know, a, a Ted Cruz or a Jeb Bush even, right, in terms of policy, maybe a little bit on the edges of foreign policy, but there was not even some dramatic reset in foreign policy, right? You, you didn't see really any any cooling of American policies to, to Russia, right, the great villain. You didn't see any moves against, you know, you, you had the withdrawal from Afghanistan, but but that was followed through by the, by the Biden regime. It wasn't even the Trump years, right? And yet clearly, the, the federal apparatus. So, and, and I mean, I, I think a lot of this, it goes back to the 2020 election, right? I, I think the continuing pursuit of Trump is because of the, you know, the, the assault on democracy, calling out the facade, right, of self-governance through all of the chicanery that we saw within the, you know, different, different state changes on the ballot, right? You're just simply saying that, you know, the federal government really doesn't represent you is, is, Something that has, you know, we, we see it play out with a lot of the motivations on January 6th. We see it with, you know, Mitch McConnell, the art conservative, um, um, you know, taking, you know, weakening his own sort of stature within the party that, you know, he, he, he the, the base of the party that he gets his power from, right? That there, there's something that it is more aesthetics and optives that dry that, that trump drives these people crazy and yet here you have again an, an incredible escalation and, and i i don't think that this, this is something dismissed for all the other faults of trump again I, trump couldn't even fire fauci when he was in charge right but the substantive weaknesses of that trump time have fueled the regime making all these missteps and now you have this very interesting dynamic going on here right where you have the fbi going into florida Ron DeSantis is Florida and catching Florida authorities off guard at this. I'm, I'm interested to see the way that that tension build up, right, against, you know, federal versus state authority there. I, I think that is something that you know, if, if based off of DeSantis' record, I, he, he knows how to use an issue and, and, and really, you know, milk it for everything and, and provide action and not just the press release for it. I'm interested to see the, 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 the dynamic there. But again, it's, it is... You have half the country now that has had this feeling in their gut for, for now two plus years of being enemies of the state. Now they, 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 they've put even, even more fuel on that fire. And I, I don't think they have – there's there's limits to what the hard power that they can really apply, right? You have the, the, the means of the state, right? You know, they, they've, they've got people with guns. They've got a, 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 an increasingly growing tax auditing army. Right. There's there's ways that they can attack you financially, et cetera. But th these are all hard power institutions that the state can use to beat down their political enemies, you know, the the the, the, the other party. But there's limits to what that hard power can really 
due to to the spirit and kind of the soul of things. And I don't think they have any, you know, the, the, the unit party was at its strongest, right? When their number one weapon was the press and not state officials. It was the perception of two parties going at each other when really in the, the day they're on the same page. And again, the actions that they are taking now against a former president, this is not the way that historically America goes about doing things. And I, I, again, this is, this is in many ways a, a very good trend to the extent that it exposes the regime for what it is. But it is something that increasingly looks more and more like, you know, South American banana republics. I've got a buddy, J.P. Ferreira, um, uh, who talks about like the Brazilianation of America. And we were, we were having coffee earlier today and he was talking about how like, you know, if, if you look at some of the, the dynamics within Brazil of, of like their former president in Boston, American politics are very much now resembling Amer uh, uh, Brazilian politics and South American politics, right? Where it's whoever has power is, uh, is oppressing their, their political rival uh, in, in, to, to make sure that they maintain that power. And again, I, I think there's going to be limits there to how this can play out in the long term. Um, but again, it, it's, I was expecting that, I, I, this doesn't surprise me. I, I, I've been expecting for a while that you know, I, I, I take seriously their hatred for Trump, but it is interesting to see it actually come about. And again, the, the, the response just, just says the Trumpers were always more interesting than Trump himself as a figure. The response of the Trumpers to this is is going to be very interesting going forward. Yeah, you you always have to not totally disregard just the issue of personal politics, right? right? Is that, yeah, everybody has their teams that they play for, uh, and there's ideology as part of it. Uh, but a lot of the time, a lot of these people, they're just petty and they just like to destroy people who they dislike. Uh, and so uh, you can't just totally dismiss that aspect of it. It may just be something personal that they just personally hate Trump. And of course, they would deny that all day long because they're consummate professionals and they're not motivated by normal things that normal people are motivated by. They would never go after somebody for personal no, reasons. It's about protecting Obvious democracy nonsense. and the rule of law. Right. right. <laughs> But you are right. It uh, it does. And of course, Latin America is one of my uh, you know particular interest areas in grad school and all of that. And I was always surprised uh, because I was naive at the time reading the separate histories of South American countries and so on. So many of these countries have they have a national hero, right? Like George Washington type of figure. And but but at least half the time that national hero who everybody reveres as soon as he's out of power. He gets either driven into exile or executed. <laughs> this is how they roll in Latin America. Once you're out of power, well, it's my job now to destroy you, to investigate you. You're not allowed to just retire to the countryside. Uh, you either have to leave the country or be executed. Uh, so that that seems to be sort of the the, the drift that the that the Americans are are going in. But part of that, of course, that's it's the um, the it's the expected outcome of making the federal government so powerful, right? What was different about those Latin American countries? is that they were much more rules from the center in many cases. And they had this Caudillo model where you had this strong, powerful man at the center. And that's what really a lot of the power in a Latin American country revolved around. There weren't, it wasn't all dispersed through all of these local uh, states or through even just dispersed through institutions at the federal level. So you had to destroy someone who had his own personal following at the federal level because he could exercise so much power. And so uh, we're still living, I think, with the results of this massive accumulation of power that occurred after the mid 20th century. And so now that presidents essentially rule by edict now with so many executive orders now being the way they rule because the Congress doesn't pass laws or uh, change laws like it used to. So now we'll just have the president do everything. And so now the president has a massive amount of powers, much more hero worship now even than uh, before. In some cases, it's more personality driven. But uh it, it it's all really the as you say uh, the result of this this real peak in power of these federal institutions that occurred, I think in the mid twentieth century, and that was the time where you as you know you had the press 
You had private organizations. You had local schools really driving home how the federal government was virtuous and wonderful in every possible way and how the FBI was uh, uh, just an impeccable organization. Uh, and I always remember how the, the late Paul Cantor, uh, he had a great book um, uh, called Gilligan Unbound, and he had a whole chapter there on the X Files, and the X Files, and that chapter examined a lot of a lot about the the FBI and its reputation, and why were the heroes of the X Files FBI agents when the show was anti FBI, right? But of course, the hero agents were odd men out, right? They were on the fringe of the FBI. The FBI central structure was corrupt to the core. Was basically what that show was talking about. Um, but I just remember in his discussion of the FBI in general, I think he really well summed up how Americans viewed the FBI in the mid 20th century, where he, he, he talked about a, uh, a movie called The FBI Story, which I believe st uh, starred uh, Jimmy Stewart. And, uh, th and the question was, how do, we, how do we justify the existence of the FBI? Because there were still old timer Americans who uh, remembered that the FBI was this new invention uh, and uh, really actually wasn't necessary and also was not authorized in any way by the Constitution. Uh, but they just, hey, we're the federal government, uh, uh, commerce clause, blah, blah, uh, FBI, now, fine, constitutional. And uh, so there was a line he quoted in the movie about, like, some kid asked, you know, why do we have the FBI? And the FBI agent says, you know, well, Billy, the reason we have the FBI is because as the country grew, crime grew too, and now we need a federal law enforcement agency. And that was all it took for a mid-20th century American who basically would just believe anything uh, people in Washington told him, because that's that's how people were in the mid-20th century. Just, you know, they'd been brainwashed in school with the American flag and the picture of Abe Lincoln to just believe that if the federal government does it, it must be necessary. And uh, so, you know, the old timers still believe that. Uh, but I think some of uh, the younger people are starting to wake up about what the nature of these organizations really is, even if the, even if it's still very vague. Um, but yeah, that's that, I think that's the roots of the current situation and has been going on for several decades now, really culminating in a massive amount of power in the early 90s and, and throughout the, the 1980s. And I don't think its power is really growing like it was, and I think it started to hit some real headwinds, but it accumulated so much power over the 20th century. And you had... Uh, and it wasn't even just conservatives that were really supporting stuff, as uh, Lou Ruggles pointed out to me. And it's true, of course. Uh, one of Ayn Rand's favorite movies was The Untouchables. Um, actually, it was her favorite show. That was a show before it was a movie. Um, which, I mean, just shows, right? Because she loved uh, the, the idea of these highly effective federal agents uh, attacking these irrational anti-life people or whatever. Uh, just shows how ignorant, easily uh, duped uh, Ayn Rand was. When it, well, any show of power she worshipped, right? Military power, federal law enforcement power. She loved that because she just always imagined it was going to be used against the forces of irrationality or whatever people she hated. Uh, and so there, there was just this huge amount of um, just sit back and accept whatever the FBI is doing. And the fact that that no longer seems to be just gospel is a new thing, but because they've ac accumulated so much power, they can now basically behave uh, like uh, party hacks from Latin America, who uh, like Fujimori's people, who just can go around the country arresting people, killing people, <laughs> doing whatever to destroy his enemies uh, in Peru. Uh, that's just how we roll now in this country, and, and so unless you really start to rein in these organizations, uh, it's you're, that's just something we're gonna have to live with for the foreseeable future. But as you say, though, I think the only way to really fight that is to start getting some real pushback then at the state level. Um, and that could be, I think eventually states just out and out refusing to assist with, uh, FBI investigations and, uh, with arrests and simply saying, we're, we're not going to help you because the FBI, of course, relies heavily on local law enforcement to help them out in a lot of cases. Uh, but you could theoretically have just uh, state patrol uh, just impede the FBI in its investigations in some cases. And of course, the feds would throw a fit and they would defund the state and they would sue the states and all of that. But that's really the only way, I think, to really make life difficult for the FBI. And then, of course, to stop giving them immense amounts of cash to stink at what they do, right? The FBI failed utterly with 9-11. Uh, I mean, just the level of incompetence 
is quite astounding that uh, the the FBI exhibited in the, in the lead up to that disaster. Uh, but what did they get afterward? They got a they got a pay increase. They got more money, and so that's just. That's just typical for an organization that's good at uh, destroying political enemies, but really does very little in terms of actual law enforcement. I mean, the real work's done by state law enforcement, local law enforcement. The FBI just shows up and usually takes the credit for the work that others do in those sorts of investigations. Going back to your point about Paul Cantor and the X-Files, I'm now formalizing the idea of the X-Files being the original Q psyop. Right. Like you, you, you can trust these institutions because while there might be a lot of bad people within it, there, there's, there's a few, you know, there's, there's, there's those good actors that are really trying to take down, you know, the, the, the child traffickers or the aliens or, you know, whatever, whatever the corruption is. Right. Where, where Scully and Mulder go one, we, we all go right. Like it's they, they are the storm. I, I, I think it is interesting, though, because, you know, you mentioned about how how kind of the old timers might still have that romantic view of of you know, American power and whatever. And, and that's what I think is so interesting is I, I think that is changing. You know, I think some of the most radical people that have the distrust of the feds are, again, it's that, that Fox News boomer. And again, this is the major shift of, you know, Bill O'Reilly, you know, being the, the head of the face of Fox News to Tucker Carlson. You know, it, it is this interesting d- dynamic where in that 90s, in the 90s, you had, you know, you, you had King of the Hill with, with sort of the the the, 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 the conspiracy theorists in there. You, you had, I think, sort of a, a little bit of, of a cultural distrust of, you know, the regime, if you will. And, and of course, all that got wiped away with September 11 and the Bush administration, right? And so like that, that was the, the, the any any sort of grounding uh, anti-regime 90 style sort of conservatism, you know, completely went out of, yeah, completely evaporated after uh, September 11th. But of, and of course, now all of those tools are being wielded against middle America, right? And, and uh, Jeff Dice had a great tweet earlier about how you know, you know, a reminder that, that you know, prison reform n- is never applied to Trumpers. You know, that, that this is what I think is gonna be interesting is, you know, what are the next steps here? Because I, I think that this is not, you know, I, I don't think this is just for show. I don't think that this is, you know, something that is going to end with, oh, well, golly gosh darn, you know, you wanted us to take Trump seriously. We're here, you know, we're, we're doing an active investigation and nothing's going to happen the same way with the Clinton emails. Now, I, I think this, you don't take this step, in my opinion, if you don't plan to follow through with it. Um, I've been telling people for, for a couple months now that you know, I, I fully expect the feds to prosecute Trump. Um, I think there's an interesting dynamic there where you, you have the January 6th committee. You have a playbook that we, 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 we see so often, much the same way where whether it's January 6th, whether it was the attempted coup against you know, Gretchen Whitner, the, the governor of Michigan uh, back in 2020, where you know the good old fashioned war on terror playbook where the FBI comes in, identifies a, a, a few uh, uh, you know, online you know, extremists, you know, uh, you know, Muslims or whatever, and and then entrap them kind of within this broader, you know, bombing threat that they would have never done without the assistance of the FBI. This is now being used against, you know, three percenters and oath keepers and, you know, the, the, the America militia right winger types, right? In much as, it, and, and so we're seeing that play, that classic playbook being used now against the right in a similar way where you know the FBI, the response to the accusation often becomes the actual crime that they prosecute on within the January 6th committee. Um, you know, Liz Cheney has been kind of slowly building this case where what really matters is less the testimony of the day, but more her statement at the end, kind of saying, hey, look, we have evidence that basically President Trump is talking to witnesses that he's not supposed to do. And you know, they were making the case for witness tampering. Um, you see the, uh, within Atlanta, the Fulton County DA there, uh, there there's been a, a case being built for violations of state election law with Trump's sort of infamous phone call to uh, the secretary of state there saying that he, he needed higher vote totals. You've seen it with the way that the Alex Jones trial dealing with the Sandy Hook parents, um, you know, they they got his cell phone, which is the, the fact that uh, his, his lawyer just, oh, coincidentally, leaked Alex Jones' cell phone to the prosecution. Funny how that thing, you know, that, that happens to certain people. 
Um, you know, that opening up new files of evidence, you know, I, I think they are absolutely ready to prosecute Trump. I think that the uh, uh, January 6th style investigations of conservative activists are, are, is, is not ending anytime soon. And, you know, again, this is clear that, that they, 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 they see a real threat and they're going to respond to it. What will be interesting to see is the response from the Republican Party. Again, currently, the line is, oh, well, the, the DOJ needs to go before Congress and explain themselves. In fact, I just saw a tweet from Andrew Cuomo, which is interesting because it's, it's always funny, you know, when you have that sort of the sort of rogue Democrat who's no longer in the in crowd and then they kind of start like whistling a little bit to like their former enemies. And so like Andrew Cuomo even said, the FBI, the DOJ must go before Congress and explain themselves or else it's going to be seen as a political witch hunt. Um, that, of course, is not enough, right? If, if Republicans, if, if that's the framing that Republicans are setting themselves up, and, and you, it's, it's, it's funny because you read all these congressional tweets and you see just how much of the wording is the same uh, on the Republican side is the, the weaponization of federal agencies and that they must explain themselves. It, it, a, a hearing in front of Congress isn't going to do anything. Um, it's going to be interesting to see, again, what do the states do, you know, all the things that you just listed out, and particularly with DeSantis, where, again, if we if we look at what he has historically done, he, he has his, his most interesting quality as an executive is turning the, the red meat press release into action, right? It, it's not simply enough to criticize woke corporations, but we are going to take away Disney's taxing privileges. It's not enough to criticize Fauci, but we're going to explicitly stop corporations from imposing vaccine mandates on their citizens. It's not enough to uh, 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 talk about critical race theory and why it's bad, but we're going to act legislatively to purge it from the universe, both the college and the university system, right? How he responds, I think, is going to really identify how serious is the political right to this threat. If, if DeSantis, and let's put, it, let's put it this way, if DeSantis does not have a credible policy response to what the FBI has done, then I, I think that very much is a black pill in any sort of growing right wing movement against the 20th century centralization of power. Right. But if he is able to, to respond seriously in a way to really impede what the feds are doing then once again, we have a model that some, not all, red states can replicate. And this creates a very interesting sort of broader trend. The, the Arizona primary last week, uh, uh, we, we saw two very interesting Republicans, one Blake Masters, um, who is, is very familiar with Austrian libertarian literature, which I always like to see. But the other one is Carrie Lake, who is very much sort of positioning herself as the, the DeSantis of the West. And you know, the more that we have governor's mansions occupied by these figures whose entire political persona is not built on tax cuts and, and like, you know, a, a good policy. And again, not the same thing wrong with any of this, right? But, but, but less that, oh, hey, I'm a, I'm a serious conservative policy wonk, but rather is entirely baked in their entire identity is kind of this Trumpist reaction to, and, and honestly, this, less than it being kind of Trumpist, being really sort of the embodiment of the sort of rhetoric that Steve Bannon would use about the administrative state, you know, not a broad endorsement of, of necessarily everything Steve Bannon has, has, has said and done over the past, but that, that, that ethos of, you know, the, the administrative state is the threat. Um, you, you know, I might be a little more optimistic than most, perhaps that is a, a product of, of, uh, uh, of, of wanting, you know, of, of, of youth there, but, the response here to this from a policy standpoint is going to, I think, really say a great deal about whether some of these positive political trends are worth, you know, having some interest in or whether it is complete sort of retreat <laughs> and, and that there, there is that in, in the, there's nothing to you know, that, that, that the, the lovers of power are just going to keep on marching. The machine's going to keep marching on. Because again, like, it, it's the, the fact that the, your average voter is so, it, it, there is opportunities for opportunistic politicians beyond simply high-minded idealism to respond to this. 
And again, what that looks going forward, um, again, it's going to be again, the most interesting aspect of this moment. Well, and another thing to keep in mind is that federal criminal law is uh, unnecessary, a joke, has no connection to real justice. You can nail someone in federal court for basically anything, for some of the reasons that you've noted, right? Is that, oh, well, he's not actually guilty of anything, but, but he lied once to FBI investigators. So now we'll get him in, in prison. So there are so many tens of thousands of unknowable pages of federal, federal law, federal rules, um, such as, you know, right, if you're found in possession of a certain kind of fish, you face years in prison, something you may not even know, something you may have innocently committed while fishing, right? That's just sort of a generic example. But there are so many rules that you might not have any idea about because it has nothing to do with an actual victim, right? Real law has something to do with, oh, did I hurt another person in some way? And you can kind of guess if you're breaking the law or not. Federal, federal law isn't like that. It's, it's so administratively based. It's so based on all these tiny little details designed to nail people. And then on top of that, the federal government in, in its courts has basically unlimited resources. So even if they can't convict you, they just bankrupt you. And that's, that's clearly their strategy in a lot of places. Uh, so you, you, nobody can win, basically, once they have you in their sights. Uh, maybe if you're a complete Boy Scout, uh, you can avoid being completely bankrupted. Um, but maybe they can just destroy your reputation. Uh, but basically, anyone can be a victim. And if it, if it was a real crime, there'd already be state and local statutes against it right? We don't need federal laws against murder because that's already wrong. Everyone knows it. There's state statutes against it. You don't need federal laws against theft. And so the idea that we've got just these layers and layers of some little sort of administrative uh, thing that you did and might have done unknowingly and had no idea and intent, by the way, has nothing to do with it than in these federal courts that they'll just nail you anyway. And so there is an inherent injustice there that the deck is absolutely stacked against you. And unless you're a billionaire, uh, it's really hard to really even put up any sort of real defense for yourself. And yet you still have millions of Americans who believe that nonsense about if you've done nothing wrong, you have nothing to fear. And I don't know how long that's going to keep going. Uh, one of the benefits. And, you know, I've always said this about, uh, you're, uh, about people who claim right? Non-white people who claim that the, that the deck is stacked against them. And then uh, all of these people who are absolutely against the racism narrative, they, they, they get it wrong. They come back and they say, no, uh, the, right? Law enforcement officials are fair. And uh, the, the deck is absolutely not unfair. It's not stacked against you. Really what they should be trying to say is, yeah, of course, for a lot of people, the, these legal institutions, especially at the federal level, are unfairly administered. There's bias. Uh, whether in this particular case it was based on racism, I don't know. But sure, I'm absolutely open to the idea that, that, these, that these trials are unfair, that agents are applying the law unfairly. But instead, they go in the opposite direction and end up defending federal prosecutors no matter what, which is just absurd. And so there, the, still, people haven't quite figured out how to deal with this. The tribalism still gets a lot of these people, a lot of conservatives, defending federal law enforcement, uh, federal law in, a many, in many cases, if the target of federal law enforcement is some guy I don't like. And so that's how you end up with empowering these organizations, that they do go after you or after people you do like. Whereas we we got to start being consistent on this. Look, these people not only are the, is this is the deck stacked against you, but these are, these organizations are just completely unnecessary, right? There was no federal law enforcement prior to the twentieth century. It was all justified 
based on this idea that the states were too small or too poorly funded to enforce the law. Uh, never true. Also, not a problem for Europe. There's clearly no connection between the size of a state and its ability to enforce the law. By that measure, Switzerland should be crime ridden. Mexico should be an extremely safe place because Mexico is a huge country with a much larger GDP than Switzerland. Why isn't Belgium overrun with crime? There's no continent wide police force in Europe. They have Interpol, which is which has no ability to arrest people, to to conduct specific organizations against people. It has it's not in any way like the FBI. It just allows these different local police forces to to exchange information. That's if the FBI were to exist, had to exist, that's all it should do is help facilitate the exchange of of information. But the fact that they have agents who can arrest you, the fact that they can haul you into federal court where the the deck is very much stacked against you. Um that's that's just a sign about how difficult it's going to be to really push back against these organizations. But it's going to take, I think, a lot of real institutional pushback at the state level and the local level as well. Yeah, no, and, and as, this is going to it's, it's, it's interesting because you're seeing it play out a little bit within some of the, the new right you have and a variety of different issues. Right. Oh, well, you know, the, the answer to big tech censorship is increasing kind of federal power to break up big tech companies versus a more sort of states driven model. And I, I think it's, it's going to be interesting going forward, which of those, because we're seeing this shift, this intellectual shift from the right, um, you know, for one, it, it's, it, is there going to be that shift actually hold up in the wrong, long run? You know, we, we, we've seen interesting moments in the past that, 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 that can sometimes fizzle out. Will it be trying to maintain, is it trying to, to turn the, the, the federal government into, you know, the, the conservative, you know, federal government or whatever term they, they want to use, um, or is it again decentralizing it? Is is it having more aggressive states? Can I have, you know, I, instead of the the Huey Long, every man a king? I'm personally a fan of every every governor a king at this point as creating sort of bulwarks against the federal uh, a state in that part. But it, it, again, it's, it's whether or not this continues and it gets actionable. Um, it, I, I think I think that's going to be you know, one of the de defining aspects of the American politics within the next few years. And of course, it's, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun today when we see all, Demo all these Democratic politicians who are, who are going to be uh, uh, you know, trying to make uh, statements about, you know, no person is above the law or, you know, all this sort of stuff, while at the same time, uh, again, just this, the, you know, the, 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 the same people. Like, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to Nancy Pelosi using that line, um, as, as, I, as I think she has in the past, actually. I think she was uh, using it earlier for some of the prosecution of Trump. You know, while while her husband gets off whatever he wants to do, and then they're insider trading, all sort of stuff. Again, I, you know, the, the beauty of it is that this this isolated Beltway class. Again, we've we've always had evil people within the the powers of central, yeah, within the within the regime, within the imperial city, but they've never been this lacking of self awareness, this this cartoonish, and again, even their. Uh, like again, again, you know, just just one more point about the Arizona things. I think ties into this, is that the model now for reaching out and getting like independent voters, you know, the, the sort of you know the, the the theoretical moderate, right? It's no longer someone who doesn't like taxes, but is socially liberal, right? You know, this yeah that, that that's that's the the sort of moderate independent sort of class that parties are going after. Um, I think what's, what's more kind of that, that interesting middle ground is like the Joe Rogan listener, right? It's, it's the Tim pool fan. It's this sort of center that, that they, they are skeptical, not of, of necessarily the, the strong ideologies per se, but of, of politics in general, they think both parties are corrupt and you, you see that sort of manifested within kind of the, the attacks in the media, um, you know, Carrie Lake has, has a very interesting ad, which like she's like taking a sledgehammer to a bunch of like corporate journalists. But that dynamic of the 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 political cynic as the middle targeted voter is something that is is very interesting. I think it's a change of how again, po politicians in the past have operated. And I, I think most people still don't get this, right? I, th I think most politicians, being you know smooth brain, you know mediocrities. They still don't understand the era that we have right now, but the most interesting political figures are the ones that realize that they can make inroads with the politically cynical class. 
And I, I think those are very interesting allies when you can, if you can couple kind of the, the, the loyal Trumpists with the political cynics. That is something where I think you can build a, a broader coalition against the worst people in America. And again, that that is again my need for optimism to keep keep going throughout the day. Uh, um, that's something that is again I, I think these sort of moments are highlighting that aspect of Amer- American politics. And the beauty of it is, I think ninety nine percent of DC is completely oblivious to what is going on outside of it, which explains why they're so ham fisted and and lacking of subtlety. <laughs> More than anything else, I and mean, I, I, th- I think that that presents itself in very horrifying ways. I think, and we should all be terrified of what a, a massively rearmed IRS can do to normal people. But the beauty of it is that the more they reflex this hard power muscle, the more that there's there's consequences to that. That you know, to to again like that 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 the, leg- the, the perception of legitimacy that Rothbard talks about anatomy of state that is the cost eroding that perception of legitimacy is the cost of all this. And, and the more that they, they erode at that, the more interesting uh, uh, things can get in the future. And I think really what uh, the anti-establishment group has to do is is take it beyond just Donald Trump. Right. Right. As long as just this it's this movement uh, that's circled around Donald Trump and views Donald Trump as the savior. I mean, but what a what an unreliable person to base your movement upon, right? Uh, but Trump, I think, by accident, stumbled into this movement that he thought he could use to make himself very, very popular, um, and I think sort of ended up trying to to harness these sentiments, these these grievances, uh, where people were realizing they were being screwed essentially by the federal government, uh, that the ruling class didn't care about them, and in fact hated them. Uh, and you start to see that right under Obama with his disparaging remarks about, you know, these these hillbillies with their guns and their Christianity and all of that stuff. And then Hillary Clinton clearly hated these people as well. She hated half the country. Right. And so half the country didn't didn't like being hated. Uh, and Trump, for whatever reason, seemed to pick up on that, even though it had nothing to do with his prior life or his own personal ideology or anything like that. Right. And so I think then he just kind of went along with it. And I guess that's how he ended up being hated in Washington, because he seemed to be sort of speaking for the half the country that didn't like being denounced regularly by Washington insiders. Uh, but as if it's just Trump, then the FBI will succeed in getting rid of whatever power those people might have hoped to have. So, yeah, you're going to need state level people. You're going to need uh, people in uh, corporate America, people in educational institutions who are willing to say these things and really represent those those people. And that's going to take a lot of hard work because these organizations have really reached the point where they're just getting rid of anybody who doesn't toe the Washington line. Um, but maybe the the only first place you start to begin that rebuilding process is in the state legislatures and then in the governor's mansions. Maybe that's really the only place that these sorts of uh, Trump voters have any power left. But yeah, it, it's it's maybe time to move beyond Trump, the guy. I mean, uh, he's 78. He'll be 78 years old if he runs for president in 2024. We really need another 80 year old and one like Trump who who appoints John Bolton to an important position, who, who appoints Pompeo, who appoints people like Christopher Ray. I mean, clearly not a competent administrator, not someone who could actually implement any sort of important movement. So, yeah, it's it's got to be a non-Trump thing. It's, it's it's time to to get over Trump, but but realize what was good, mostly on accident, about Trump, and and try to do something uh, with that. But it's been good that the FBI has shown its true colors by its willingness to basically investigate uh, a guy just really clearly because he was a political enemy of the current oligarchy in charge. And uh, so it's uh, it's got to be a more sophisticated movement than we love Donald Trump. Well, see, and that's the beauty of it is that, again, like, if, if when D.C. gets what it wants, if it removes Trump from being able to run legally in 2024, then they've cleared the path through, right? Like they, they, right. they, 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 their own actions again. Like they're so obsessed with with that sort of like revenge politics that they, they don't recognize what the next step is. <laughs> like, and if you take Trump off the board, then guess what you're going to get? You're going to get right. someone. You're going to get Trump as martyr figure, and you're going to get someone more competent than Trump coming in. And you know, it's that's that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it. But you know, as, as we conclude, 
Uh, I, I did do see now you have some some Republican congressmen again outright calling for the elimination of the FBI. Dr. Paul Go Gozar, who's a very interesting member. Dr. Gozar, if you are in need of a witness at a at, at an upcoming congressional hearing, talk about the elimination of the FBI. May I recommend Mr. Uh, Ryan McMakin? Ryan, any last last thoughts here? <laughs> No, I'm like you. I'm just very curious to see what happens next. Uh, but uh, it's it's unless the uh, the opponents of these people who are prosecuting Trump can move beyond these these feelings of love and 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 gratitude and uh, emotional attachment to federal agents and federal law enforcement, then, then no progress is really ever going to be made. Well, this has been Radio Rothbard, Bo Bishop for Ryan McMakin. Thank you for listening and see you next time.